So I have been, as you were kind enough to say in the introduction, working on a variety of things. But in the last 10 years, they've become, they've started to converge. And the theme they've started to converge around is the reality of time. And the claim that fundamentally, and you'll see this emphasized over and over again from different points of view, time is fundamental. And by time, my co-authors and colleagues and I mean something close to what Henri Bergson meant. That is a, a real active time which is becoming and which creates event by event, the history of the world. Here are some of the papers and some collaborators. We were just discussing Marina Cortez, who's a key collaborator in the construction of a, of a type of theory called energetic causal sets. And we'll see their importance here. Recently, there are two, one is not listed here, very provocative, we hope, papers with Claudio Verde and then there, you'll see there's more coming. Now, in fact, the way that we see it is there's a big research program based on the transformation of physics from the timeless or block universe point of view, which I think many of us originally shared as little baby children physicists before we grew up and began to think more seriously. And what I'm gonna to talk to you about today is sort of the core of the program. And the core of the program is closely related to fundamentals of quantum mechanics and pilot wave theory. But just, this is the last time I'll mention these subjects. The, the idea that not only is time the most fundamental thing, but laws are not fundamental, that laws change and evolve, goes back of course to Charles Peirce and other people. And, there are important reasons why that is part of the program that I'm talking about. Although, unless there are questions, I won't get to talk about that. And similarly, the whole issue of whether fundamental physics is reversible or irreversible is core to the program. But then again, there's a number of developments which I won't get to talk about. Let's just mention them. This is a very important slide. This is a slide we shall go to when anybody asks for mathematical details, because I certainly don't have time to present them. That was supposed to be a joke. Okay. So I've been very happy to hear that philosophy is well respected in this community. So I indeed myself am very influenced by philosophers and particularly by the notion of relationalism as it comes to us through Leibniz. So the, for me, the most important principles philosophically are Leibniz's general principles, say coedinamic monodology and the principle of sufficient reason. And especially I'll make very strong use of the principle of the identity of the indiscernible. And then just to show the power of the identity of the indiscernible, let's supposing as we will in this talk, have an ontology of events. And events have causal pasts, which are a series of events that lead up to a present event and causal futures. Now, supposing we have two events whose causal past are isomorphic. If we are determinists and believe that physics is deterministic, their causal futures must be isomorphic because their causal pasts are isomorphic. And if there's a deterministic law constructing the causal future as a function of the causal past. The causal futures must be the same. But Leibniz's principle of the identity indiscernible is exactly the, op the opposite of that. It demands that the two causal futures be different if the two causal pasts are the same. Otherwise, we have to identify the two events and we can't speak of two events. That's part of the power for us of starting with these principles of Leibniz. And when I need to, I'll hide behind them, as you'll see. Okay, now, there are many implications of these two principles. One of them is that there are no fundamental symmetries. And there are a lot of people, say in my generation or older, who are trained that the search for deeper knowledge or more unification in elementary particle physics is a search for larger symmetries. And this philosophy 
cautions us that, and actually it was Roger Penrose who, won, who first clued me in about this, that we should be looking for less and less symmetry as we go deeper and deeper in nature. And we'll see how that works out in the theory I'll be explaining to you. It's a theory of events where every event is unique in its properties as the principles of identity and discernible calls us to do. So those, that's a very important difference that you'll see come out. Another one is that space and time are relational, but in different ways. For us, as we said, time will be fundamental, the most fundamental relation. And we'll think of time as a real actual act of time flowing the universe. And space will be emergent. Space is somewhere way down in the list of things to care about. So we will be making very important use of a concept that is kind of stolen from Leibniz. We developed first with Julian Barber a long time ago. And that's the idea of the view of an event. An event is in some causal network. So when an event gives rise to future events and still future events, that, that imposes a causal ordering on the set of events. And we can therefore talk about the causal past of an event. And the information about, a cause, about an event's causal past, that it in some sense knows that, is, that you could measure at that event, be called the view of the rest of the universe of the event. So, and this is very important, that each event, as it participates in the laws to give rise to future events, has as its resource its past causal set. And each past causal set is in some sense the name of the event. Events don't have names like Lee or Jack or 37Q or whatever. Events as a friendly relationalist are determined by the view of the world that you have from that event looking back into your past. So that's a very important concept and we'll see that. And, and this is irritating because it's not shifting again. And, um, hmm. Perhaps uh, you, you are clicking in the space bar or are you clicking in the arrows? I'm clicking in the arrows. My own uh, arrow seems to run away. Uh, the, the pad usually it works. That's what happened to me too with my program. Oh, good. Good, 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 good. Okay, well, we're, we'll skip the one we just skipped. This is a little poem that I extracted from Leibniz, but given that I just lost a few minutes, let's just keep going. We can come back to that at the end. Okay, so in any fundamental theory, yeah, that somebody should come back to us and say, okay, you claim you have a fundamental theory. What is fundamental in your theory? And what is emergent, what is constructed as emergent from the fundamental ingredients. So for our theory, what is fundamental, as I said, are events, the causal relations amongst those events, plus energy, plus momentum. There is no space, there's no space time. There's a network of events and their causal relations, but we do impose that these events are endowed and the causal relations from say event I to event J are endowed by energy, momentum, and perhaps other charges. And what indeed is an event? This is a rather recent thought that we developed with Claudia Verde. In the quantum theory, an event is a, is a, is a well, it's first of all, a process something that happens in time where some degree of freedom that is indefinite becomes definite. That is, we take the distinction between definiteness and indefiniteness of some observable that can be observed from an event as fundamental. And we'll see how we can organize everything around that notion of definite versus indefinite. So what is fundamental here? I'm just stating it again events, causal relations, energy, momentum. And emergent will be space, time, configuration, space, space, gauge fields, geometry, light cones, and quantum mechanics as well. And I'll be showing 
in outline how we derive quantum mechanics from these kinds of principles. And look at the bottom in particular, we have among our observables, in fact, or among our vehicles, energy and momentum, but we have no position, we have no embedding of events into space and in space time. So we have no non commutative algebra, we have no place for h bar to appear, and indeed h bar so far doesn't appear. Okay, so this framework, there are many different versions of it. And I'll show you one that's been published the last few papers. It's called the causal theory of views. And here are the basic ideas. And this slide repeats, but more precisely, we're out of the ingredients that I specified. That is events, a network of events with causal relations and paying particular attention to the views of events, which are the information about the causal past of an event. It could be measured that event. We want to do physics, we want to do dynamics. And there's no derivatives, there's no space, there's no differences, there's no di distance between two particles. So how are we going to define the dynamics? And the only thing that we have available is the views of the events, which are the only vehicles. So we're going to construct the fundamental action principle only out of those, only out of the views of the events and differences between them. So there's a mathematical side. I told you I'm skipping the mathematical detail. Among the mathematical details that I'm skipping in the relativistic case, and this is in draft but not yet published, is how we think about the view of an event in a relativistic sense. And this connects to some mathematical technology, which is being developed by other people recently, called the study of the celestial conformal field theory and things like that. But I won't be touching that in this talk. So um, here, this again is mostly repetition, but let me go to the top. How is dynamics defined? By what we're gonna call a half path integral or a half integral which is a sum over causal process, it's like a path in a row. And people thought we're integrating over energy and momentum, summing over the causal processes, but we're not integrating over position. So we call this a half in a row, and I'll be giving you examples of it. And what replaces locality is difference in views. That is rather than talk about the distance between you and me or the derivative of functions, where I am, we're going to talk about the difference between your view of the past and my view of the past. And differences of those which are causally related are going to go into the, the basically the kinetic energy. And what will go into the potential energy is what we call the variety of a set. The variety of a set is a measure of the distinctiveness of all the different views. That is, we sum up over all the pairs of views and put their distinction or their difference, which we have a numerical measure of. And that, that's in various guises going to appear as V, the variety. And just to tell you where we're going, that function on the original set of views when we construct the non-relativistic limit is going to become the Bohmian potential. So those of you who want to sort of guess how we get from here to there, that's the key result that makes this connected to quantum mechanics. So, again, we have an, a, an events ontology, events and their causal relations. And there's a big group of people working on that called causal set theory. Faye Dapper, Phil Sorkin, and others. And we, what we do is related to them, but we have more imposed structure because we impose energy and momentum living on the causal sets. That is, every event has is endowed with some energy and momentum. And energy and momentum is conserved at each event and transferred to future events. And because of that, there is a conservation law at each event, and that will be important. And just to emphasize again, there's no space time. There is geometry in this formulation. The geometry is the geometry of momentum space. 
that is in order to measure the differences in the distinction of views, we have to be able to put a metric on momentum space or something like momentum space, okay? There are two parts to dynamics, just like when we do ordinary, say, quantum field theory perturbatively, we pick a sum over Feynman diagrams organized by some power, prior series approximation. And then in each diagram, we sum over the unconstrained energy momentum. And basically we do the same here, only the, the first part, which is analogous to a Feynman diagram, is picking a process which develops into a causal set with energy and momentum. So here is, given that we do the first, here is the analog of the Feynman amplitude. If the amplitude for some total process P is the product over all the unconstrained momenta, a delta function at each event, which tells us that energy and momentum are conserved there, and an amplitude Q, which has the, what I was speaking about, about the potential energy related to variety, which will be related to Bohm's potential and the potential and the kinetic energy. So this is the complete definition of the theory. And notice there's no H bar anywhere because there's no canonically conjugate position relative to the momentum. There's no commutation relations. There's no uncertainty principle. And for people who like to worry about non-locality, there is simply non-non-locality and no locality either. Uh, there's no mention of embedding of these causal processes in space. So there's no locality. There's no non-locality. These distinctions are going to emerge when space emerges, which will be something that happens dynamically in, in, the, in the certain limit, which we'll be discussing basically a stationary phase approximation. Okay, now to tell you a little bit more about how the potential energy is constructed, here's a little bit about variety. So variety is a measure of complexity, but it's complexity in the mind of how distinct are the subsystems and how distinct are the different views. So imagine that you're in a city, an old great city like Lisbon, and you know it well, somebody could put you down anywhere on any corner, take off a blindfold and you know instantly where you are because every corner is distinct. The view from every corner from down any street is distinct of any other nearly because it's an old great city built up chaotically. Whereas if we put you down in the suburb of Toronto, every corner looks like every other corner and you wouldn't know where you are. So the first kind of situation is what we call a high variety situation. And the second kind of situation is a low variety situation. And we have a measure of variety. One way, if, if the situation or if the, the system that we're talking about is, is causal graphs, we sum over all the pairs of events and for every event, we count outward one step, two step, three step, four step at each of the two events. And the lowest number that we count to sets that that subset around the first event is not, is not the same, it's not isomorphic to the subset around the second event. We call them distinctive at level K, if K is a number of steps. And then we just sum over one over K. And that gives us the notion of the variety of the set. Okay. And by the way, I'm happy to take questions anytime. So these are biology produces lots and lots of examples of causal networks. These are these happen to be pictures of genetic regulatory networks um, developed by some of the people at Santa Fe. And they, if you measure their variety, they're often high variety sets. The kind of lattices that we physicists, condensed matter physicists or particle physicists like to work with are very low variety sets. Um, it's interesting to try to generate numerically high variety sets. And there's a collaboration at Microsoft Research led by Jaron Lanier that I've been very honored to be part of. And part of what we've done 
And this is, you're going to ask him the questions, why in the variable theory? Well, it should be clear from this talk. Um, we, we have to generate very high variety graphs and study them. So that's a thousand node high variety graph, which is the biggest one we've been able to construct. It has an unusual degree distribution. Um, and this is just to restate the basic construction. The basic construction is we have um, given two views of the past of some event. We have a metric HIJ, which is the distinction between them. From that, we construct the variety and the variety is part of the action principle. It's basically analogous to the potential energy. So in words and in concepts, it's very easy. We're very Leibnizian and we're asking the universe to develop and increase by increasing its variety. Okay, so here we're gonna talk more about the action. Here's the half integral as I defined before. And let me note that the Hamiltonian has this kinetic energy and potential energy. And there are free parameters, G and G prime. And it's gonna turn out not surprisingly that G prime over G squared is related to H bar squared over M. That, that will not surprise people who work with hidden variable theories. Oh, oh wow, it's working. And here's, the, uh, maybe I won't dwell on this given the time, but here is the sum of how the details look in the non-relativistic version of the theory, which is the one I'm mostly talking about here. P lower K upper I is the energy momentum transferred from event K to event I. And that's what the causal network is constructed from is first constructing the network and then dividing up pieces of energy and momentum and distributing them across the network as, as dictated by the equations of motion that come from that action principle. Okay. So, Here is the cheap trick because everybody, when they're trying to do something new, finds a cheap trick. The cheap trick is, I've been saying there's no space, there's no space time. But for each event, there is a constraint, which is the conservation of energy and momentum at that event. And I can exponentiate that constraint by introducing Lagrange multiplier Z or Z, for what's called Z, and writing delta of the constraint as integral over dz of e to the i z times the constraint. And z is in the dual space to momentum space, in other words, configuration space. So the z's are a way to get an emergent notion of an embedding in space-time dual to momentum space into the theory. So that's kind of the cheap trick. And then we go to the stationary phase approximation. There's here a number of details I'm skipping. We split the fluctuation into transverse and longitudinal. The longitudinal, of course, are the gradient of a phase. So that's how we address the issue of how to get the, some of the momentum um, coded as the gradient of a phase. The other transverse degrees of freedom of the momentum we integrate, we, we integrate over and end up with expressions just related to the gradient of the phase. And um, I'm, I'm happy to come back to details. There are, it's a little, few stages of calculation. Um, but here's the key point. The action principle had three parts. The Lagrange multiplier Z times the constraint which is some over momentum. The, what I'm calling the causal part of the variety, which is the kinetic energy. And that involves the differences between the use of causally related events and the a causal part, which sums over the differences of use of not causally related events. And they go down to, um, after you do all the integrating acts you can do and you integrate, you introduce a probability distribution row to represent an ensemble of such systems. And then you, the action principle becomes rho, the integral of rho times uh, what looks like the hamilton jacobi equation with the additional potential, which, you know, not surprisingly turns out to be the Bohmian potential. 
the kinetic energy goes into the P squared, which is the gradient of the phase squared. The, the potential energy goes to the Lagrangian potential. And the role of the Lagrange multiplier creates the symplectic structure. In other words, the structure of rho S star. And that, as I'm sure many of you know better than me, generates it when you vary it the real and imaginary parts of the Schrodinger equation. So I think that's that's a step that will be very familiar to people. But let me emphasize something important, which is that there are corrections. So there is a delta U Q, which emerges, and these are. These are, uh, maybe it's best if I come back and say what the expansion turns out to be in, but there's a natural expansion. Well, I'll say it in terms of basically the number. You have, when I introduced the probability distribution, I posited a, a kind of collection of similar systems and I average over them, they become an ensemble. And N is the size of the ensemble. That I use to generate probability distribution. So we see that basically one over n to the two over the dimension is fixing the size of these corrections. And those are types of corrections that violate unitarity, but they're consistent with probability conservation. And they've been studied by different people. So that's not new, but it's important to emphasize they emerge from here. Okay. Um, where am I? And maybe it would be good to pause for questions at this point. We still have an audience. I want. I'm still talking to anybody. Any, any questions? There's yeah, a hand up. Robin, please go ahead. Um, so I would say uh, it's, it's lovely to see you. Are much more expert about this than I am. But what I have, what I imagine, is that in the quantum laboratories that people are developing. There are some systems which entangle states of some combinatorial complexity, which the question is how many natural such states, copies of the states will exist. If you're talking about something like a hydrogen atom, there's a large ensemble of natural or pre-existing ensembles that anything we work with in the laboratory will be a copy of and will be part of an ensemble. But it's pretty clear that with, with the technologies that we have, like quantum dots and many other things you know about better than me, we can construct states which if we ask, is there any isomorphic entangled state anywhere created naturally, the answer would be unlikely. So that's the kind of thing that I'm thinking of. And then there's a science fiction joke that comes at the end of that, that lets you work out for yourself. All right, well, thank you. Okay. okay, so so we've got multiple hands up there. So Yeah, it's good. So here's a slightly different form of the action. Here's the Lagrange multiplier Z, if you look in the upper left, multiplying the conservation laws for P. Then I have conservation laws I call R. And this is in the version of the theory where we're starting to introduce curved space time. So let me just ask you to ignore those and ignore the, well, the conservation laws multiplied by the script ends are the energy momentum relations, paralysis of energy momentum relations for the energy momentum on each causal length. So um, basically we look at the equations of motion and when we look at the equations of motion, we notice this thing, this equation at the bottom left that the difference between the Lagrange multipliers for two events that are connected by a causal link, Zi and Zk connected by the causal link Ki, have a momentum Pki and the equations of motion of stationary phase tells us that the difference between those Lagrange multipliers is proportional to the momentum times some Lagrange multiplier that is so arbitrary scalar quantity for each link. And so that is telling you that the two events in this emergent Minkowski space labeled by the Lagrange multipliers are separated by a space-time interval related to the momentum transfer from one event to the other. And if I have a lot of different relations like that for all the different pairs which are connected by causal relations and I can consistently satisfy them, 
then I will reconstruct Minkowski space time. So that's the idea and outline. And that's uh, just another picture of it that is making it consistently. Just we have equations of motion for the two causal edges, and by satisfying them simultaneously, we get space time distances between the events. And this is a theory of relativistic massless degrees of freedom. So we end up with the energy momentum being null and the intervals between the events being null. And th this is just reminding us that if we want the inverse momenta, which are given by the, which are where the Lagrange multiplier Z are expressed. And if we want them to look like a position, we have to introduce an arbitrary constant. And that's where H bar comes from. Okay. Now, if you go one step in the expansion past that, you can get long chains of events where energy momentum flows principally in one direction and out in another direction. And those look like the trajectories of relativistic particles and satisfy the equations that free relativistic particles satisfy. And if you allow there to be events from time to time where more than two inputs and outputs are important, you get interactions. And they look exactly like the interactions between relativistic particles and non-relativistic particles. So we get the basically the basic dynamics of relativistic point particles emerging in emerging Minkowski space. Okay, so that's the basics, um, and I think I refer to the papers. Okay, so I'm almost done. The adjacent possible is a nice expression that we get from Stu Kaufman. It means what's the next thing that can be done. So this build a special relativistic version and I mentioned at the beginning, we're using these ideas based on celestial spheres, which various people have been studying as a tool for that. Incorporating general relativity by making, giving connection degrees of freedom on the causal links. Um, trying to derive quantum field theory and to distinguish that from relativistic quantum physics. There's a lot of challenging issues there. Um, there's a whole research subject from about 10 years ago called Relative Locality. We were interested in what happened to basically the phenomenology of dynamical particles when the space was curved or otherwise distorted. And then um, we can develop more of these to America. So that's what the kinds of things we're doing now. Um, and I think that's the talk that's prepared. Thank you very much. <laughs>